for someone exactly like you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades, friends, shalom. Um, we don't have a chair, and I'm, I'm not going to appoint myself as such, but someone has to start, and it's going to be Martin. Uh, <laughs> Professor Amos will give you a, an, opening, an opening burst about uh, Saul Bellow, on which I'll endeavor to comment and elaborate, and then there might be a bit of cross-talk between us, and then it'll be, as it were, your turn. And I'll be in charge of that bit, too. And while you're thinking about it, I say now, all boring questions will be disallowed, <laughs> as will all speeches. So while you're getting ready, I've done audiences like you before, believe me. <laughs> um, bear that in mind, if you would. Um, Professor. Good evening. I hope you can all hear me. Um, it's meant to be about Saul, but we're going to, as Christopher was saying beforehand, he fans out, you know, like a, like a galaxy. And we'll come back to him. Uh, I went to Israel with him, in fact, for a Saul Bellow conference, and um, he, I went with him to the first session. And he said after 10 minutes, if I have to listen to any more of this, and there were things like, you know, the, the encaged cash register, existentialism in early Saul Bellow. He said, if I have to listen to another word of this, I, I, I think I'm going to die, he said. So we, we're going to talk about Israel, too, via his book, To Jerusalem and Back. And of course, his lifelong concern and anxiety about, his, about Israel. Um, the phrase anti-Semitism was coined in the 1870s by a German journalist called Wilhelm Ma whose noble intention it was to get people to stop hating Jews for religious reasons and start hating them for cultural and <laughs> racial reasons. Uh, Saul used to say that I said to him, Norman Cohn in his book, Warrant for Genocide, about the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, said that anti-Semitism was a neurosis. And Saul said, no, it's a psychosis. And I hope we'll, we'll talk about that because it's very rife at present, I feel, here in England. Um, you know, a certain kind of bien pensant here is, you know, never more gorgeously at his ease, never more exquisitely complacent than when attacking Israel and trying to delegitimize Israel. Um, so I hope we'll talk more about what, what anti Semitism is. But, um, I'm going to cheer you up by talking about philo-Semitism. Uh, the words Semite and Semitism remains problematic, but philo, we all know what that means. Love of. Um, I am a philo-Semite, and I will give you a little how-to course on what you have to do to create an anti-Semite, a uh, philo-Semite. Big it, 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 it's no problem creating anti-Semites. Um, first, you have him born into a, a boho kind of family, rough and ready family, where the father, in fact, is mildly anti-Semitic. Um, I remember when I was about 13, one of our, we had many close family friends who are Jewish, uh, Theo Richmond, was among them. We were playing Scrabble, my father and me and Theo. And my father didn't actually put down the tiles, but he, he suggested the word yid. Um, and at 13, I didn't fully understand what that meant, but I knew I didn't like it. And uh, later on, I had the privilege of being able to say to him, Dad, what's it like being mildly anti-Semitic? And he said, well, it's very mild, as you say. <laughs> uh, you know, he said, yeah, you're watching some uh, innovatory new TV program, and then when the credits come up, you find yourself going, ah, there's another one. <laughs> there's another one. Um, although you would have been horrified by 
and actively horrified by any actual stuff and was actually pro-Israel. Um, on the other hand, my mother was a woman of uh, universal equanimity, so much so that when at the age of nine, as a resident of Princeton, New Jersey, I asked a black American friend, Marty, at school, I said, do you want to come back to my house for tea? And he said, I prefer coffee. And I said, yeah, well, it's, it's actually not tea, it's, it's a sort of meal. <laughs> and he said, um, <laughs> with cakes. And, and he said, he said no, nah. he said, your mother won't like me because I'm black. And I said, with full conviction, my, my mother won't even notice that you're black. <laughs> uh, so that kind of background helps. Then, um, this is perhaps a bit more testing. You've got to supply them with, at the age of 17, with a beautiful Jewish girlfriend. Um, and preferably in the year 1967, <laughs> during the June War, where she is rushing off to give blood for the, for the Jews. Uh, her mother was secretary to Lord Seif. Her grandmother was so, it was great, very sweet, and I wish I'd talk more to her, but so observant that in her pantry, even the instant coffee was kosher. Gold blend, instant coffee. Um, so you give her the first love with a beautiful Jewish girl. Then, <coughs> Then, uh, later on, um, he have his oldest and closest friend, Christopher, discover, movingly in the year, I think, 1989, was it? Um, that he was, in fact, Jewish. Um, and that's, I thought, that's why I loved him. It what, what <laughs> wasn't for his qualities, it was because he was a Jew. Um, I can't make this completely chronological, but um, by that time, I was not only completely in love with the novels of Saul Bellow, but um, beginning to be a good friend of his too. The man who emancipated the Jews um, the, in, into the American artistic mainstream. I think that's one of his incidental achievements. And to show perhaps a, a, a deeper kind of interest and sympathy you write your novels, what your novels come from, you finally decide is from things you, you're worrying about and don't know you're worrying about. Uh, silent anxiety. And I was moved over the years to write a novel about the Holocaust and a, more recently a novel about the, anti, the, the Holocaust that never happened, which was um, the Stalinist Holocaust that was all set to go in 1953. The Jewish doctors were gonna be hanged on Red Square and then the Jews, two and a half million of them, I think, were to be, to run the gauntlet to um, Birobidjan on the Chinese border, where according to Solzhenitsyn, barracks were already being built for them. And it didn't happen uh, because Stalin died. It would have happened. Um, then finally, you've got to provide me with a, um, a Jewish wife my wife, Isabel Fonseca, and two uh, Jewish daughters, who they're only quarter Jewish, but by Jewish law, 100%. And they are Jews who will themselves be the mothers of Jews. Um, we have many names for them in our house. Um, they're seven and 10. They're called the flowers, the fools, the poems, the rats. Um, but I often, sub-vocalize them as the Jews. Um, <laughs> where are the Jews? Shouldn't the Jews be home by now? Where are those Jews? Where are those Jews? Those lousy Jews. Um, <coughs> and I, it's of great importance to me, and I can't really explain it, but it makes me feel closer to history in a way that I very much value. Um, now, I'm going to read, before we widen out again, I'm going to read a bit of a, the ending of a Saul Bellow short story called The Old System. And this, is, this is not about Israel. This is about assimilated Jews in America. And <clears throat> in this story, Dr. Brown is 
throughout this longish story, he's very anxious to see his, his sister who's dying in hospital, Tina. Um, and she says, they've had a froideur for many years, and she says she will see him on her deathbed if he gives her $30,000. <laughs> because she feels she was stiffed on an earlier uh, property deal. But then he goes, he goes, he, he's finally allowed in, and she's, all the documents are there, and he's supposed to give her the money, and, and she sweeps it all away. And the, the ring, her mother's ring, which has been much debate about, is produced. The ring she had taken from Aunt Rose was tied to Tina's wasted finger. She's dying, Tina. With dent, uh, was tied to Tina's wasted finger with dental floss. She held out her hand to the nurse. The nurse cut the thread. Tina said to Isaac, not the money. I don't want it. You take Mama's ring. And Dr. Brown, bitterly moved, tried to grasp what emotions were. What good were they? What were they for? And no one wanted them now. Perhaps the cold eye was better on life, on death. But again, the cold of the eye would be proportional to the degree of heat within. But once humankind had grasped its own idea that it was human, and human through such passions, it began to exploit, to play, to disturb for the sake of exciting disturbance, to make an uproar, a crude circus of feelings. So the Browns wept for Tina's death. Isaac held his mother's ring in his hand. Dr. Brown, too, had tears in his eyes. Oh, these Jews, these Jews, their feelings, their hearts. Dr. Brown often wanted nothing more than to stop all this, for what came of it. One after another, you gave over your dying. One by one, they went. You went. Childhood, family, friendship, love, love was stifled in the grave, and these tears, when you wept them from the heart, you felt you justified something, understood something. But what did you understand? Again, nothing. It was only an intimation of understanding, a promise that mankind might, eventually through its gift, which might, might again be a divine gift, comprehend why it lived. Why life? Why death? And again, why these particular forms, these Isaacs and these Tinas? When Dr. Brown closed his eyes, he saw red on black, something like molecular processes, the only true heraldry of being. As later, in the close black darkness, when the short day ended, he went to the dark kitchen window to have a look at stars, these things cast outward by a great begetting spasm billions of years ago. Now, it's, it's, I, my views on Israel, my feelings, impressions about Israel are um, just those feelings and impressions, and for political analysis, we will depend on the hitch. But uh, it does seem to me that has there ever been a state in history that is so dependent on emotion? Uh, Twelve years after the War of Independence, Yigael Yadin asked when the victory, had, where the victory had come from. He said it had come from Israel's youth. It appears as if that youth absorbed into itself the full measure of Israel's yearning during the thousands of years of exile to return to its soil and to live in liberty and independence. And like a giant spring which had been compressed and held down for a long time to the utmost measure of its compressibility, when suddenly released, it liberated. Um, and just a couple of short lines from, from Saul's book about Jerusalem which I think sometimes criticized for not noticing the existence of any non-Jewish Israelis, but um, I, I think a, a book that um, now seems very prescient and full of very eloquent anxiety. Um, I sometimes think there are two Israels. The real one is territorially insignificant. In fact, one-sixth of one percent of Arab lands. The other, the mental Israel, is immense. A country inestimably important, playing a major role in the world as broad as all history, and perhaps as deep as sleep. <coughs> what you do know is that there is one fact of Jewish life unchanged by the creation of a Jewish state. 
You cannot take your right to live for granted. Others can, you cannot. This is not to say that everyone else is living pleasantly and well under a decent regime. No, it means only that the Jews, because they are Jews, have never been able to take the right to live as a natural right. To be sure, many Israelis refuse to admit that this historic uneasiness has not been eliminated. They seem to think of themselves as a fixed power, immovable. Their point has been made. They are a nation among nations and will always remain so. You must tear your mind away from this conviction as you must tear it from civilized appearances in order to reach reality. The search for relief from the uneasiness is what is real in Israel. Nationalism has no comparable reality. To say, as George Steiner says, that Zionism was created by Jewish nationalists who drew their inspiration from Bismarck and followed a Prussian model can't be right. The Jews did not become nationalistic because they drew strength from their worship of anything resembling Germanic Blut und Eisen, but because they alone, amongst the peoples of the earth, had not established a natural right to exist unquestioned in the lands of their birth. This right is still clearly not granted them, not even in the liberal West. At the same time, Jews are called upon and called upon themselves to be more just and more moral than others. Um, just wind up and pa pass this on to Christopher. Uh, Bernard-Henri Levy wrote a piece in the um, New York Times magazine this last summer saying that when, when these um, twirling spastic rockets from uh, Hamas and Hezbollah land in Israel, of course, they're the focus of intense anxiety, but that anxiety is also forward-looking in that in 10, 20 years, <laughs> They will be far more sophisticated rockets with different kinds of warheads. Um, and don't you feel sometimes that the crisis that the world is in at the moment is a crisis of mere weaponry or pure weaponry, the weaponization of all grievance? And how long can Israel, born in war and nurtured by siege, as Abba Eban put it, how long can it live this life of, of intense anxiety? And this has been a summer full of portents. And, um, and it was in the, the, the pensive setting of, of Las Vegas in the summer that Christopher and I admitted to a new order of anxiety about the future of Israel. Well, um, I suppose I also should uh, I feel I owe you a statement of um, my own position on one or two things. I, uh, I'm commented from, from the exact opposite end, I think, from the one that Martin began with. Uh, for most of my life, I <coughs> thought that the only principle worth upholding, worth defending, worth advocating, witnessing for, was that of socialist internationalism, to which, of course, the Jewish people have been perhaps the major contributors, that anything else was ignoble or sectarian, uh, that uh, Zionism was potentially a, a bourgeois nationalist trap uh, for the ancient Jewish people, that Judaism was to be objected to not just in itself as a religion, but on the even more strong grounds offered by Voltaire, that Judaism has the, the terrible tendency to lead to Christianity. And if you can't dislike it for that, you don't know what it is to feel uh, hatred and suspicion. Uh, but never able to uh, uh, escape from the fact that when, well, while I was unwilling to say anything under this heading for myself, except that, as I early discovered, some of my worst enemies were Jews, um, that anyone who defamed or threatened the Jewish people was uh, defaming and threatening my mother, uh, my grandmother, uh, my wife, and my daughter, I therefore felt it wasn't really necessary to speak about this in my, in my own behalf. I still regard Israel not as the answer to the diaspora, or as an alternative to the diaspora, but as a large part of the Jewish diaspora. I was asked a very intelligent question by a lady from Jewish Chronicle earlier this week about whether I would feel unease at being Jewish if I came back to England. And I said, well, 
where she correctly reported that many Jews do feel currently a great enemy. I said, I, I don't ever expect or actually want to feel at ease. And I don't think it's in the fate or nature of the Jewish people to feel at ease or at home. I think that we are doomed to exile and doomed to diaspora. And I don't want us to become, as it were, complacent. There's a wonderful expression in Victor Klemperer's Diaries of the Third Reich, which I hope everyone here has read or will read or is reading, where he says in conversation with a comrade as the net tightens around them, we are a seismic people. We can always see what's coming. We always know in advance where the, what the tremors are going to be. We register the tremors. It'll never change. It'll always be insecure and unstable. I think that's right. I don't want it to be different. Don't want a quiet life. Also, don't expect one. What drew me to the Jewish tradition that I liked when I was a Marxist, I still am a Marxist, but I'm no longer a socialist, was, uh, <laughs> some of you Talmudists will get this, I think, uh, was not just the fantastic contribution of, to modernity of Marx and Freud and Einstein and Kafka and Billy Wilder, um, uh, but the uh, innate tendency to fratricide. Uh, and disputation and dialectic that was uh, to be found um, among it, <coughs> among us, as it were. And the, and the feeling always, wherever you were, you would always be in exile. Okay, fine, by me. I don't, I don't repudiate this. In fact, I welcome it. Uh, I could go on about this a lot. I will. I actually succeeded. I can't often do this with Martin. In surprising him a few nights ago, I can't often surprise him, that's to say, on any literary matter. I said that Theodore Herzl was the only person who'd ever written a utopian novel that, as it were, come true. He didn't know about Alt Neuland, very bad novel in many ways, but the only novel ever about a future society that could be said to be the blueprint of an actually existing state. The idea that Israel is and the Jewish project is a written one, is a work in progress, subject to revision. A literary project, of course, magnetizes me, fascinates me. Um, believe me, I could go on a lot about this, but I, was, I feel I should say why I think Saul Bellow is a great help in decoding some of it, um, and I think it's, it's principally a literary question. When, when Henry James started to try and define the idea of an English literature written by Americans or in America, in the American scene, the thing that most horrified him when he returned to the New York that he thought belonged to him was the prevalence of Yiddishkeit, as he called it, the, the murder of the English language in the torture rooms. Uh, of the Jewish coffee houses and clubs and bars. You couldn't believe that the pure well of English had been so defiled by these, these the, the aliens of Israel, as he called them. And for a very long time, this was, this was a regnant feeling. Feeling was a regnant policy in the American Academy. I'm sure many of you know Lionel Trilling was, was at one point refused tenure at Columbia University on the grounds that as a Marxist, a Freudian, and a Jew, and they might as well just have come right out with it, he wouldn't be able to understand the specially sensitive register of English literature. He couldn't, let alone teach it to others. And nobody thought that that was an embarrassing reason for not giving him the job. So, it's to me in incredibly important. I don't think in Bellow's mind it was a conscious revenge, but I, it can't have been other than latent in his mind that with the publication, especially of Augie March, that the, those whose parents and grandparents spoke Yiddish and came to America as despised immigrants, often illegal, as in the case of the Bellow family. As you know, perhaps Saul didn't realize he wasn't an American until he went to join the United States Army in 1941 and was told, you're not on the books. Your parents were illegal immigrants from Canada. You have to go back and become a citizen, and then you can apply to join our army. Uh, that's part of the background of Dangling Man. Um, never being sure of a place, that he suddenly finds that he's, he's witnessed for literature and it, uh, in English, written in a supple and marvelous way, that the admirers of Henry James have no alternative but to praise and to respect. Uh, Mutatis Mutandis, this goes also, of course, for Norman Mailer, for, for Philip Roth, um, for Joseph Heller, who's often left out of this account, I think, wrongly, and, and others too. But I think it's especially significant contribution of the man, Saul Bellow, who translated the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock into Yiddish. You try it. <laughs> um, who, with Irving Howe and other members of the D Descent magazine and Partisan Review Group, 
discovered the wonderful treasure house of the work of Isaac Bashevis Singer, hitherto really only available to those who could buy the Jewish Daily Forward and read it in, in Yiddish, and to, and to make it, people aware of what an extraordinary presence there already was of this kind on American soil. I regard that really as his most signal uh, contribution. There were those who said that this wasn't really English, that this was a sort of dialect. In fact, even Martin, in an early piece on um, Bello, referred to his occasional lapse into low-life patois, which, when I quote it in my book of essays, is rendered in the worst and yet best misprint that I've ever had inflicted on me by an editor as low-life patios. <laughs> the sort of place where American literature is considered towards sundown. <laughs> um, but there it is. Nobody, nobody doesn't talk now with some acknowledgement, not just of Kafka, and so, but as it were, of, of Woody Allen. And I guess I, I should add, that's what I always liked, again, about the Jewish tradition. Even reading the, the to me, hateful Maimonides, it's remarkable when he says, in Guide to the Perplexed, well, is it necessary to believe that the Messiah will come? Yes, it is necessary to believe that the Messiah will come. But then he adds, though he may tarry, now, you don't get that shrug in any other monotheism, I'm telling you now. And you can read Woody Allen out of Maimonides if you want to. Everyone knows what I'm talking about, I think. I hope so. Bello ennobled all this uh, in an extraordinary way. <coughs> but it's not politically without problem. Um, it was said of Camus' La Peste that it doesn't mention any Arabs, just as it's been said of um, Bello's Jerusalem. It seems to me that I had read Mr. Samuel's Planet before I read To Jerusalem and Back, and I, I began to recognize in that and some other fellows' writings a sort of allegory of something very disquieting that was emerging in America in the 60s and 70s, which was a rivalry between uh, Jewish Americans and black Americans, especially in New York and in Chicago, elsewhere too, but particularly there. And that the, the, the sense of threat that some Jews were beginning to feel in the school boards and districts of Ocean Hills and Brownsville in Brooklyn and in the south side of Chicago was, in a sense, replicated through the experience of Teddy Kollek via Ed Koch. If you're following me about this, I can elaborate if you like. In, in a kind of allegory of, um, of black Jewish rivalry which worried Bello very much, which, of which he was, I think it can be easily said, the specially sensitive register. But I thought I saw something possibly menacing um, to both parties occurring here thought it needed to be analyzed. <coughs> it, it became, a, it's even more clarified in, um, because this tendency among Jewish Americans acquired the name of neoconservatism at a very early stage. When I think it was Norman Podhoritz pointed out with his customary grace and tact <laughs> that American Jews had the, uh, this is how he put it, the income pattern of Episcopalians and the voting pattern of Puerto Ricans. I think you can tell the sort of tone of voice that's involved there. Yeah. It's refined by Bello in, in his book, Ravel Street, which Martin has never forgiven me for reviewing as if it was in some sense a non-fiction book, as if it was the, the debt he promised to pay to Alan Bloom of a memoir in novelistic form. But in there, as you, some of you will know, there is a figure very recognizable as Paul Wolfowitz, and there's a school very recognizable as the famous Chicago uh, school on... Uh, Committee on Social Thought, chaired by Nathan Tarkov, a friend of mine, old friend of Bellows, and Leo Strauss's, and Alan Bloom's, and Paul Wolfowitz's. And in there, it is, just, it is said that the greatest shame of the United States in the recent past is its failure to put an end to the vile regime of Saddam Hussein in 1991. No, no subsequent failure has been as shameful as that, as, it were, as many of us believe. So that, though one must, I think, at all times resist the politicization of literary criticism. The remarkable thing to me about Saul Bello was the way in which he accepted the challenge of the political critique. I think I've probably said enough on that heading now. <coughs> Excuse me, Mark. Does that, does that mind you to say anything? Yeah. Um, um, he said once, I don't think he's ever said this in print, but he saw Bello once said privately, he said, without Israel, Jewish manhood would be finished, he said. Um, and I don't think he meant Jewish men. He meant Jewish self-respect. Uh, 
but it was a sort of atavistic way of putting it. Um, he, he was, <coughs> he felt that this idea that the Jews, we're going to bring it about that the Jews cannot be put to death, as he put it, um, is institutionalized in the state. And, um, <coughs> and he was, I think he was, he, he, he was beginning to have cerebral difficulties about the year 2000, quite a long time before he died. And uh, when September the 11th happened, he, he didn't take it in. He didn't really take it in, amazingly, because he was uh, just a month before I'd seen him for several days. Um, and he seemed, you know, drifting in and out a bit, short-term memory a bit, but um, totally compartmented. But, and I met a 90-year-old lady in New York who's still coming into the office every day as we speak, uh, yet who couldn't take in that event and didn't really try to take in that event. And it's as if um, he, he, one of the, his unfinished books was called All Marbles Still Accounted For. But um, when the marbles are perhaps under threat, um, there's a certain size of event that you can't assimilate. And I think he knew that he sensed not only that this was an enormous event, but it was a, an enormous event that would redound somehow on Israel. And during last summer, when, when these, these unpleasant port portents for Israel were emerging, there was a great uh, efflorescence of anti-Semitism here. If you remember those um, middle-class whiteies waddling around on the placard saying, we are all Hezbollah now. Um, well, enjoy it while you can, because Hassan Nasrallah wants to kill you. Um, he, he knew that this perhaps was going to be a defeat for Israel. And I'd like to ask Christopher about this, the rise, the rise of Islamism, which, by the way, um, we know the Muslim brother, Brotherhood got started in the 1920s in Egypt and had been brewing for a long while before. But um, it crystallized with Saeed Qutub in his um, ridiculous and ridiculously influential book, Milestones, which was conceived and written suspiciously soon after the formation of the State of Israel on his journey to America in 1949. Um, that the rise of Islamism also, the, with the Iraq war and other events, the depletion of American power in the Middle East. Um, this, this perhaps is, will be the main consequence of the Iraq war. That the period of Pax Americana, of American domination in the Middle East. And again, I'm not I'm hazy about all this, but which began in 1989 or 1991, depending on when you date the death of the Soviet Union, that this period is coming to an end and the regional players are stepping forward and perhaps even that uh, American power itself is um, nearer to eclipse or partial eclipse. Um, and this is not good news for Israel. Uh, the, the worst... Uh, disagreement I had in person with Silvello was about a friend of mine, Edward Said, a co-author of mine. Well, actually, that's, putting, that's rating myself too high. I co-edited a, a book with him. Um, and at that point, Edward Said was a, from a Christian family and was an atheist and didn't have a racist uh, nerve in his whole uh, ganglion. Uh, but the, the, it was a, just a, a, a clash, as it were, between two kinds of nationalism uh, in Palestine. And I would have said at that point that Vero had been overreacting, uh, hadn't been understanding enough about what the Jabotinsky revisionist form of Zionism had done on the West Bank and in Gaza, wasn't willing to concede uh, enough of that, partly because of, indeed, you're quite right about the manhood question. Very, very many American Jews felt that they could look anyone in the eye after 1967, the reputation of of Jews as being unmilitary, cowardly, the Luftmensch, uh, as Herzl used to call it, was gone. 
a slight element of hubris there, I thought. I also thought Bello had been overreacting to what had happened in Chicago during a brief period of black power in the city's politics when a particularly decorative figure in, in Mayor Harold Washington's uh, administration had publicly accused Jewish doctors of giving the AIDS virus to black babies. I said, well, now, look, it's, uh, okay, he's a nutcase, and he's a sordid idiot and so forth, but, you know, don't get... This, isn't, this is not the face of black America. Don't, don't become too Podhoretz-like about it. Well, look, how am I supposed to talk now? Allegations like this are commonplace now. They're pumped out in, in mosques only a few hundred feet from here. They're taught to children by people who have subsidies from the British state. It's, it's actually impossible, I think, to underestimate the way in which the vilest kinds of anti-Semitism have recrudesced in an Islamist, not a nationalist form, in a religious form. Uh, the only thing I can ever think of to cheer myself up is that these fools have to borrow the, the crummiest sorts of Russian Christian Orthodox fabrication. I refuse to call the Protocols of the Elders of Zion a forgery, as That's they're right. commonly called. They're not a, a forgery is an attempt to copy a true bill. There's no true bill behind the Protocols. It's a flat-out fabrication. Okay, perhaps it's nice that Hamas can only think of putting that on its website. They don't have a tradition of Jew hatred quite of their own, but yes, they do, and it's in their holy book the one that they say is the last word that God ever spoke. So it's in their actually, charter. It's in their charter. It's impossible to overstate this kind of thing. And now, I, now I wish I, as Martin must for many other reasons too, I wish I could have my conversation with, with Bello back again. Wish I could refine it a bit. Uh, wish I could have uh, made my own points a little sharper and, and, more, and more sophisticated. Because this is a, this is a very, very serious cultural danger, and it's only a fool who thinks that anti-Semitism is a threat to Jews. And anti-Semitism is, is a very, very toxic threat to everything we can decently call civilization. And uh, it, it, it confers upon us when we find it, even a little bit, because it's quite hard to be, mildness is good, I like, I like it, but it's quite, generally quite hard to be a little bit anti-Semitic. And I should just end when you, where, where you started about the psychosis. Of course, Steve Coakley was a psycho. He couldn't stay off the subject of the Jews. Most people who have this prejudice can't stay off it. That's the thing. If someone says they don't like West Indians because of their, I don't know what it might be, their music, or they don't like Indians because of the smell of their cooking, or they don't like um, <coughs> Koreans for their kimchi, or whatever it might be, everyone, every minority and majority in the world has a version of this kind of prejudice. But as Freud pointed out, they'll all sink their differences when it comes to the Jews. And with the Jews, it's not their cooking or their sex lives or any of this. It's, and it's not just vulgar prejudice about skin color or smell or any of this. It's a, it's a theory. It's a paranoid theory that tries to explain quite a lot. It, 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 it's fascinated with gold, with secret documents, with missing codicils in ancient treaties. Uh, with the idea of an invisible and secret government. It's a, it's a very, very, very dangerous pseudo-intellectual uh, prejudice indeed. And I think Bello was absolutely right to be seismic about it. And if the cost of that was sometimes exaggerating it, or maybe even conceivably once or twice seeing it when it wasn't there, I now think that's a very small price to pay uh, compared to the risks of being insensitive to it and, its, and the dangers that it poses. And I, that's why I don't apologize for taking such a long time to make this point. Um, we, we might just talk a little bit more about what anti-Semitism is. Um, you've described it as paranoia, and it, it is. It's, it belongs with the, the sort of the shithead conspiracy theory, and, um, and uh, there's a marvelous quote from Hitler saying that uh, in the Frankfurter Zeitung, Zeitung there was a, um, a ringing uh, exposure of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion as being a, a fabrication or a forgery, as he would have said. Uh, this alone proves that it is genuine. Um, you know, uh, where do you begin? Um, <coughs> 
it's, it's not quite a neurosis, it's not quite a psychosis. Vasily Grossman in Life and Fate suggests that it's, that uh, anti-Semitism is, is like a vast mirror. And it's, it's an ocean of insecurities um, that, you know, the cruising insecurities in, in the common mind for some reason gravitate towards the Jew as the explanation of and reason for all frustrations. Um, you know, and as you said and many other people have said, it's the, the central paradox of it is that you hate the Jews and you think they're insects and um, all the usual stuff, but you also suspect they're running your life. And, um, they're both, you know, contemptible and all-powerful. No, nobody thinks that uh, West Indians are trying to take over Wall Street, for example. <laughs> I say nothing, I, I don't, I hope no one thinks I'm making a joke at the expense of Jamaicans when I say that. It's just not alleged, people who hate them don't say they're trying to take over uh, the international financial system. I think the thing, my, my grandmother's origins were in what is now Rochevov, that was then Breslau, uh, had a very simple explanation, she says, oh, come on, darling, they're just jealous. Um, well, Goyim, of course, can be as jealous as they like, but it's actually, it's the protean nature of it that gets me. If, if they can't get the Jews for being behind international finance capital, it'll be because they're behind international communism. It's got to be one or the other, but and often both. Um, and uh, as the, you know, the Crusaders, long before they got anywhere near Palestine, had burned out every ghetto they came across and blamed the Jews for the Black Plague and poisoning the wells and so forth, Any, anything you like. Uh, the depressing thought about this being that there's something ineradicable, ineradicable about it. My view as a determined atheist is that there's something else that's often not mentioned out of politeness, which is the following. There have been, there have been several false prophets, including several Jewish false messiahs, as you know, but there, there are two very well-known false prophets um, in the shape of Jesus and Muhammad who have tremendous number of sympathizers around the place one way or another. <laughs> the only two thing, the only thing these two false prophets and demagogues have in common is this. They first introduced themselves to the local Jewish population saying they were going to vindicate their prophecies. And after the Jews had had a square look at both of them, they said no. Now, they took the Maimonides view. The Messiah still tarries. There isn't a Christian or a Muslim in the world or in the history of the world who wouldn't have given, in theory, everything they had for a little face time with Jesus of Nazareth or with the Prophet Muhammad. And the only people who did meet these two imposters saw through them right away. You think this is going to be forgiven? You're wrong. <laughs> but take pride in it. The Jewish people's achievements have almost all taken place <coughs> since the time of Jewish emancipation from religion since the dual emancipation from the ghetto imposed on them by anti-Semites, and since their own emancipation into secularism, the world of Einstein, Freud, Marx, Kafka, and the rest of them. The, 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 first peop the people who laid the curse of monotheism on the human race in the first place were the first ones to repudiate it, and all of their glories have taken place in that secular diaspora. Well, that's what I think, anyway. <laughs> um, and, and there's no health outside that. There's no redemption. The following prophecies, looking for holy places or holy sites and so on. No, no, no. That's a waste of Jewishness, a complete waste of Jewishness to try that. And it will involve you uh, in committing injustices against others. And we are rightly forbidden, rightly forbidden to do that. It, it probably can't be, I'll throw it open in a minute, or you will hit you. It probably can't be in in eradicated because um, we know of the phenomenon of anti-Semitism without Jews. Uh, there are places with no yes. Jews at all where anti-Semitism thrives. So it, it does seem to be like several other regrettable human traits, just a part of being human and uh, a despicable part, but a part. So, mm -hmm. Well, you know, at that point, I think it's possible, bewitched as you are, um, <laughs> that insufferable complacency of these two uh, young English golden boys, uh, <laughs> quasi-Semitic uh, claims. 
Um, I can't actually see anybody properly, and I don't know if there's a roving mic or not. I'm just going to trust you. Why doesn't someone ask an amusing or intelligent question? <laughs> is, is there a mic? Is there something like this? Ma'am. Just before we take the first question, Mr. Hitchens, if I could just ask Peter Levy to say a few words. He should have done it at the beginning. We uh, overlooked him. So, then we'll let... I don't want to... No? Are you sure? Okay. Well, you, wanted to, you wanted to step on my... Uh, well, no, thank you for... Hi. No. Um, I've got, first of all, I'd just like to say it's really, really wonderful to see you both here and yes. feel really honoured oh, that you're nice. here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is, I mean, this isn't 100% a question about Judaism at all, but um, in your wonderful book, Experience, um, you say that the mother of your first daughter was manic depressive, and I just wonder whether, um, because that's also genetic, partly, and I wonder whether you um, have interest in it or in, in manic depression. Um. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a Woody Allen question. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think it's um, it's it's an absolutely tragic condition, but um, and and funnily enough, one of its symptoms is anti-Semitism. Um, uh, it is. Um, another of its symptoms is is ordering grand pianos um, and Rolls Royces. And uh, I had a, a friend whose husband was manic depressive and she went to the hospital and uh, went to the doctor and he said what's he doing now she said Rolls Royces and he said well it'll be grand pianos next and, uh, and she drove home and there's a grand piano being winched into that <laughs> um, I think it's a uh, it's um, Unless, of course, it's, it, a winch, yeah. it's a <laughs> it's a it's it's very humiliating when you start following a, a kind of schedule of uh, ridiculous behavior, um, reinforcing the view that, that insanity is, is, it's not as if you're gonna do anything, you're gonna be doing these specific things. And um, you know, nothing seems to be more important than, than not doing what other people do, and not being part of an ideology, not being part of a crowd. Um, this seems you know, more and more urgent to me, not using the, the kind of language that everyone else is using, you know, no-brainer and went pear-shaped, and don't do that. You reveal your low cultural level so starkly when you use these phrases that are, that are skimming around these a already aging novelties that you know, some people, their whole vocabulary consists of seen it, done it, had a banana. Um, <laughs> that's a real humiliation. You've got to s stress the, the power of the individual. And of course, that's what manic depression, like many other things, completely strips you of. In one of Martin Sarver's novels, there's a, a, a very arresting and haunting description of someone whose mind is becoming unraveled. And, unfailing predictive sign of that, and I've seen it myself in many cases, is, is the feeling of anti-Jewish persecution, or the feeling that Jews are pervasive and everywhere. It's, it's, and any, anyone who's professionally involved in this phenomenon will tell you the same. It's a, an, an, another universal concern of the manic depressive is electricity. They're always leaning into the light bulb to get some message beamed down from them from another world. But extraordinary that in this pentagram, Mick Jagger is another element in this. Um, you always think he's trying to be you or you're trying to be him. Jews, electricity, Mick Jagger, um, you know, <laughs> what could be more humiliating? It's quite good company, I mean, <laughs> you look at it the right way. Uh, but, but the fact that the, the Jews are, are wired in even to this well-mapped and miserably predictable uh, psychosis is, I think, a, you know, almost a poet poeticism, but also, again, showing us that it is, it is uh, universal and eternal, this, this terrible recourse in the human mind. Do I see another hand? 
in the background. There we are. Hello. You said that uh, anti-Semitism is an obsession with people who feel it, um, but uh, it's also an obsession with fear of it and analysis of it is also an obsession with Jews. Um, do you think that Jews should try and avoid uh, identifying themselves through these negative means? And if so, how? I'm not sure I understand the grammar of the question, to be honest with you. <laughs> Um, I, I, I Do you understand I mean, the meaning of it? What, 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 negative, what, what, what negative identifications are you, are you having in, bearing in mind? I, uh, identifying as Jews through feeling uh, fearful of anti-Semitism. Well, that doesn't make it... it doesn't, I, I can just tell you for myself, I mean, my mother wanted to pass. Um, which is her perfect right to do, as many, many Jewish people have, um, especially in England, where it's relatively easy. Um, she didn't want her firstborn son to be given any bother for being the son of a Jewish woman. And in fact, she wanted me to be an English gentleman. You be the judge of how well that worked out. <laughs> um, and and that's, that's perfectly okay. But my, my view is, my, my conclusion from finding out what happened to her and what she wanted and, and what she got is that um, in no tone of voice, if the question was asked to me, are you Jewish, would I, would I say no? And I can't imagine what uh, would make me change my mind about that. It's not a matter of going around affirming it or, or wearing a Star of David or anything of this sort around my neck. Just, no, I, I would never say no if I was asked. I don't think that's too much to ask you. I think for a By the way, Quite Can you life. think of anyone, any other minority in the world that has this question in its mind? Making the point that Saul Bellow was making or Martin was ventriloquizing from Saul. Polish people don't have this problem. English people, by definition, don't have this problem. Uh, Slovaks don't have this problem. Jews do. Why the hell is that? But they should keep, keep a low profile and not earn any, any, any money and not make any contribution to the arts or the... Stay away the, from nuclear physics, above all. Yes. <laughs> and psychiatry. <laughs> it's, it's actually sad, and this is an extraordinary thought, that <coughs> the great uh, efflorescence of irrationality around the early decades of the last century was a reaction to the weirdness of science. Um, you know, Hitler and Lenin and Stalin would never use the word reason without putting some insulting adjective in front of it, like cowardly or <coughs> miserable or abject. And that's because uh, Jewish science had shown, had shown the essential weirdness of many things about the human condition. Einstein had showed the weirdness of space Freud, the weirdness of, of, of human psychology, and the, that caused a revolt against reason. You're absolutely. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, that reminded me of something. I used to be friendly with Jacobo Timmerman, who some of you will have, I hope, heard of and maybe read his book about being the editor of La Opinion, the best paper in Buenos Aires when the fascist dictatorship took over Argentina in the uh, 70s, and he was... Um, disappeared, as they used to say in Argentina, desaparecido, and when he gave an account, it's a wonderful book if you haven't read it, Prisoner Without a Name, Cell Without a Number, he gave an account of the way in which he was tortured, not just the methods, but I mean the, 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 the questioning, and they, his uh, fascist uh, torture said, you know, we know what it is to be a Jew, uh, Senor Timmerman, you who claim to be an Argentine, he said, you've ruined our entire lives, he said, you're your Einstein has ruined Christian cosmology and replaced it with chaos and speculation. We used to know, you know whether, how the heavens worked, and now we've spoiled all that. Your Dr. Freud has ruined our family values and our certainties about uh, the, the decencies of uh, the organic uh, Christian family. And your Dr. Marx has made uh, Christian economics impossible. Uh, this is between blows of the cattle prod. You know, you thought, yeah, they're getting, they're getting the point. They're getting there. 
uh, in their primitive way. It was actually quite an insightful thing for them to say, as it is for, for, for Christians and Muslims to never forgive the fact that uh, Jewish people were the first to see through their false claims of prophecy. Be proud of this. I would. I am. Comrade, bring it on. <laughs> Martin, I wondered if you could share with us the most amusing, insightful moment that you shared with... Can you give it some welly, sir? Okay. I wondered, Martin, if you could share with us the most amusing and insightful moment that you shared with Saul Bellow, please. Well, it would be at the expense of the hitch. Uh. <coughs> <laughs> and, I, and I had to say, bring it on, didn't I? <laughs> well, it, I, 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 I will do this briefly and, and tenderly, but um, <laughs> I took Christopher to meet Saul in Vermont, Saul and his wife Janice, um, and we had a very nice drive from Cape Cod to Vermont. A buddy movie buddy movie, radio on. Um, then we got there, and I said on the way, I said, no sinister balls, okay? Which is our code for, you know... The, Politicizing. The, yeah, of, of making everything suddenly very steely and political. And he said, I oh, am. Yeah. And um, then went into a four-hour... Was it? Fuck uh, off. <laughs> blue oh. streak of parrot shit about about Israel, and, uh, and it was, it was, I mean, I, I can't understand why they didn't hit it off immediately, because they're both, both Jews, both ex-trots, um, both rebels above all, but it was one of those anti-matter meets matter, um, and then uh, as we were sitting over the ruins of the, of the evening, I'm sorry, uh, and and it, Hitch had been defending Edward Said, and he, and he, and he said, to whom admittedly Saul called a terrorist. Um, <laughs> it was by no means, um, you know, one-sided. And then, uh, but not, nonetheless, a uh, uh, slight pall over the, the end of the dinner. And... And Christopher said, well, I'm sorry if I went on a bit, but um, Edward Said is a friend of mine, and, um, and if I hadn't defended him, I would have felt bad. And then there was a silence, and Saul said, how do you feel now? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never had a chance before to, so just settle down. I hope you've got a drink and everything. This may take me some time. <laughs> uh, I'll make it terse. You should read Martin's account of this in, in his wonderful memoir experience, which I hope is pile high outside the hall, as well as at fine bookstores everywhere. It's the, it's the most Rashomon experience of my life. As I read his account of an event, I realize it's exactly true, and exactly true as he re recalls it, too. I couldn't <coughs> fault it, except for one tiny thing, which was that... Wrong cigarette? Um... When he said, look, don't oppress him with politics, I said, don't worry, but I won't do that. But although I knew he was a very political man, always had been. And he used to be one of the editors of New Politics, he used to be very involved in the Trotskyist movement and so on. We had a few handholds. You know. When we arrived, you've forgotten this, but I thought I did you credit. He said to us, um, he was reminiscing about the time he was hired by Time magazine as a book critic, as a young, young man. He thought, I've got a job. They're paying me to review books. He arrived at Time magazine. He was told, have you, um, on his first day at work, have you had your interview with Whitaker Chambers yet? Then the boss of Time said, didn't know we needed a meeting with Mr. Chambers. Yes, you do. It'll take place at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Went into the office. Toad-like figure of Chambers sitting behind the desk. Mr. Bellow, take a seat. Tell me what was your course of study at the university. Bellow said, I studied English literature. Chambers said, very good, the queen of subjects. Give me your view, if you would, Mr. Bellow, of William Wordsworth as a poet. Bellow said, I uh, don't dissent from the prevailing view he was a romantic poet. Chambers said, 
there is no place for you in this organization. <laughs> you must be out of the office by close of business this afternoon. Told this story, which you can read in a, a fictional version in um, Victim. Uh, right. Mr. Rudiger uh, does this to Vera. And he told us this story brilliantly, and we were sitting there, and he said he'd had, and I realized I had simultaneously had the same two thoughts. He wondered, what if he'd kept the job? He might have been remembered as the book critic for Time Magazine. <laughs> a horrifying thought. <laughs> and then the second question also had occurred to me. I was determined to do my best to Mark. What should I have said? And I said, I'd already got there. I said, well, you should have said William Wordsworth was a former revolutionary Republican poet who saw the error of his ways and became a conservative and a monarchist. That would have kept you the job. <laughs> and Bello said, you know what? That's, ob that's obviously right. That's what he was hoping I would say. So I thought I'd done a bit of credit for yeah, Mark. That's fine. I ju I just but, but as Chekhov says, when there's a fucking great revolver on the mantelpiece in the first act, it'll be fired by act three. <laughs> And the, and the own, in this, the house of this consummately literate man, and in all his books, and, where we were sitting on the low life patios, um, <laughs> or outside having a drink, there was only one thing to read on view, and it was Commentary magazine. And the cover story read Edward Said, Professor of Terror. And I knew we were probably going to have to go through something. Like that. <laughs> but what was I to do? If I didn't defend my pal, when Martin was there, how was Martin going to know I wouldn't defend him when he wasn't there? Uh, uh, Picture, to, if you will. Is. Just to, <laughs> to wind it up, I rang the next day and I said, I, you know, so, so sorry it didn't work out. And um, Christopher went on a bit and, and Saul said, oh, don't worry, he said. He, he was never anything but totally sweet to me. And he said, he said, I get that all the time. And I said, that's what the hitch said. <laughs> um, yeah, so like, why he gets it all that Saul had been through a lot of severe Talmudic and Trotskyist and old sectarian arguments. He liked that kind of thing. It was one of the, it, I also think he made tremendous use of it in his fiction in a very undogmatic way. He, all of that was always available to and accessible to him. The arguments that on tiny points that have to take place wherever there's more than one Jew speaking. Well. I'm interested, to, a really brief question. Should um, Jews criticize Israel if they really think it's taken a wrong path, or do you think they should shut up and close ranks safe in the knowledge that there'll always be someone else who'll do it? <laughs> no, I think they should, don't you? Look, there's, um, that's it? Yeah. <laughs> I just don't want to step on any of your lines. <laughs> there is, there is a very old, um, as you know, a Jewish anti-Zionist tradition. I mean, and the, used, the only anti-Zionists used to be Jews. The, the Muslim world didn't know there was an argument going on between Herzl and others. The Christian world barely cared, and many Christians thought, well, if they insist on going to Palestine, we certainly wish they would go somewhere else. Madagascar would be fine, Uganda. Uh, and so on. There was a, there was a feeling, why, that's why Arthur Balfour was um, the great enemy of Jewish immigration to Britain was the keenest Zionist, and so on and so on. But there was an old Jewish critique that said, this is not going to come to any good. You only replace the question of anti-Semitism if you move it to Palestine. And you may do an injustice to the existing inhabitants there. And it's messianic, which can't lead to anything but grief. And I have a great sympathy for the founders of that argument, back to Abram Leon in, in Brussels and many, many others. I think that they were quite prescient. It only replaces, it hasn't made Jews safer. It hasn't made them more popular. Um, it isn't the alternative to diaspora, because if every Jew in the world was to move to Palestine, the state would have to be at least twice the size it currently is. And I can imagine quite a lot of argument about that. Uh, really quite a lot of argument, and it wouldn't just be from people who don't like Jews. Some people would have to move out. So, and as I say, I think Israel is part of the diaspora, not, a, not a, an answer to or an alternative to it. So, that's the first overarching uh, point. The second is that I don't think one can take part in the argument about Israeli policy less vigorously than Israelis do. 
And there's absolutely nothing unpublishable on this point in the Israeli press, which is one of the things that makes the Israeli press and, and the Knesset debates a pleasure to read. They, it's the central and recurring point in Saul's book that, that the Jews hold themselves to a higher standard. They have been, they, they have been reminded of that, and they constantly remind themselves of that. And um, reading, reading Martin Gilbert's history of Israel, which I recently did, there is, there is definitely a drift away from the moral, the moral standard that Israel set itself around 1977 with the switch, historic switch from Labour to Likud. And then you do immediately get um, Sharon calling for censorship. Um, with that shift, with Begin and so on. Um, and, you know, Saul says that Israel should have been a sanctuary. That was the idea, and not um, the Holocaust Museum equipped with an air force, which is what it's often in danger of, of becoming, it seems. Um, <coughs> So it, you know, any whisper of, of, of muffling those voices is is pernicious in in the context of Israel. The, the, the Jews have to be able to speak out. Of course, they do. Um, Christopher, uh, you said earlier that something. I'll stand up. Yeah. You said earlier that something was a tremendous waste of Jewishness. And uh, it sounded like a challenge. So I just want to ask you, what is Jewishness for? Well, I think I, I, you know, I, I want to argue against myself. This is a beautiful question. I mean, I want to argue against myself in a way in that I don't think these things are really in the genes or can be. But there's something in the, in the history and in the culture, the tradition, if you want, that is very uh, reverent for learning, which m means almost by definition uh, very insistent on skeptical inquiry, free inquiry, and very aware that there's no such thing as natural justice. That, as Bertie Wooster puts it, we're not put on this earth for pleasure alone. And if you like, some of that is innate. If it isn't innate, it's obviously not genetically innate, it's, it's incultured. And I, I'm very suspicious of anything that contradicts or dislikes that, and I certainly think that any any Jewish voice that's either uniform politically or confessionally or messianically is, is to that extent a negation of what is valuable and wonderful and terrible about the collective experience in all countries and at almost all times. I, yeah, that's, I, that I, would be, it's a waste of Judaism to be like that. What the Jews are for is for seriousness. Um, it's a country without small talk, uh, Israel. Um, and it was a black day, I thought, for that country when uh, El Al was banned from, by the Knesset from landing or taking off on the Sabbath. Uh, that's not serious. That's not Jewish. <laughs> you no, know, you have, we have Goyas to do that. Yeah, employ Goyas yeah. to do that. Uh, Shamasko edges that. It's easy. Uh, the, the fact the Jews are the first ones to find out that God is a fool, and that if you milk the cow uh, with, uh, w with the bucket under it, uh, that's no good, because that's a violation. But if you leave the bucket under the cow and someone else who isn't Jewish comes along and just decides to milk it, that's kosher milk. <laughs> you think God doesn't notice? He's an idiot. Well, I could have told you that to begin with. <laughs> uh, other religions don't have this kind of, um, if you like, brilliant hypocrisy. <laughs> what is the story? Irving Howe used to tell this story, I remember very well. So it's about, I think it's about the town of Helm, the shtetl of fools, um, where there's a guy on the, on the ramparts of this ramshackle shtetl, and he just stands there gazing out across the swine-strewn plains of the... <laughs> of the Goyim uh, from dawn till dusk with a fixed expression on his face. And so well, what, do you, what are you doing? What, what, what's your job? He said, well, they pay me to do it. Uh, I'm supposed to keep an eye out for the Messiah's arrival and to ring this bell if, he, if I see him coming. 
the, the choosing his words with care, says, well, how's it going? And the guy says, well, it's steady work. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great Israeli rock group, I've forgotten its name now, it had a big hit a few years ago. At the time of the missile, was actually saying, the Messiah is not coming, he's not even going to call. <laughs> and of course, religious Jews oppose the, the state of Israel. Well, of course, I didn't so mention in the anti-Zionist critique that I mean, you, you would have to repress a great deal of Judaism. I mean, I, I, I should have been the first to say that. Now if you uh, repress the anti-Zionist uh, because I, I sometimes go to meet the Natura Carta uh, types and others who, you know, are, once you've got over their view that the Earth is 450, no, 4,300 years old, uh, they are very good Talmudic arguers about all kinds of things. And they, they really believe it's a blasphemy to have a secular Israeli state. Nothing like that can be allowed. It's condemned uh, until, the, until the Messiah comes. And there are quite a number of uh, such sects, and there always were. So you'd, you'd have to still the arguments within Talmudic Judaism in order to say Jews mustn't criticize in front of the Goyim. And saying you mustn't criticize in front of the Goyim is to replicate the cringe in the first place that says you're shuffling around the shtetl hoping not to attract attention, that you're a Luftmensch. Uh, so I think that in a way all these questions answer themselves. Hitch. I wanted to ask Christopher Hitchens. Oh. Well, ladies first, I think. I wanted to ask Christopher Hitchens whether he thinks he's become more Jewish by living in America and how he would characterize the difference between British Jews and American Jews. Martin, come um, did, I, did everyone hear the question? Uh, well, the answer, oddly enough, is in a way yes. I mean, if I, I think if I'd been brought up in the United States, I would not have lived as long as I did wondering why my grandmother looked like a gypsy, which is what I thought she looked like. I would have recognized her more swiftly as a Philip Roth character <laughs> than Dodo, uh, Mrs. Levin, than, than, uh, than I did in England, where these things are much more reticently dealt with. Yes, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very forward thing, including in my, not just in my favorite city of New York, but my hometown of Washington, D.C., it, the, the question of who is, and, who is and who is not Jewish and what the implications of that are is an everyday, very major frontal discussion. My impression was when I lived here, I haven't done it for a long time, that that's not so much the case. And I don't know which I prefer, by the way. I think I prefer the American. There has been this... Do I see any difference between American Jews and British Jews? Yes, uh, but there's, there's a difference between American Jews and almost every other kind of Jew, which is this, um, that they're very, did you see any of you the recent discovery of the letters of Anne Frank's father? Yes, yes. yes you did see that. Extraordinary, and the ways in which everyone to whom he wrote from Amsterdam trying to get out uh, was, could, everyone in America, including Jewish friends and distant relatives, always raising the bar. Well, if you can provide a few more character references, if you can deposit a bit more in a bank in New York, if you can show that you're not a communist, always, always kept on. There's a, there is, in, in among American Jews, a terrible shame about that period, which is identified, as some of you also know, with Rabbi Stephen Wise and many people of that, of that period, the, the, the realization that they, they could have done a great deal and they didn't and the absolute determination to, if you like, cancel that miserable thought. And they can't because it keeps on coming back. And the idea that we'd have had to wait this long to find in New Jersey the letters begging from Anne Frank's father is proof enough of that. It's extraordinary. Yes, that's what makes American, American Jews feel a special responsibility. No question about it. I don't think the Anyone in Britain feels quite that way about the Nazi period. First, because Britain did take quite a lot of Jewish refugees, even though it often interned them as enemy aliens when they got here. And of course, tried to turn people away from Palestine and so forth. It's, it, isn't, it isn't as horrible. The memory isn't as ghastly. Also, we have 
a more shameful history in that we banished them for four centuries in the Middle Ages, and there's no equivalent period in American history. So. No. Perhaps one more? Uh, there was a, a gentleman standing right in front there. Uh, George Steiner commented that every Jew should sleep, should <coughs> sleep with a full suitcase by the front door and be able to speak a number of languages. It presumably, hopefully, won't come to that. Well, I think every person should probably have the suitcase at least mentally packed. Mm. And to be polyglot, is, there's, no, there's no shame in that, in that <coughs> either. The problem is, where are you going to go with this suitcase? <laughs> For example, people say to me, well, why are you critical of Zionism? What if you know, the fascists took over the United States? You know, what, if it, what if there was a big movement of, what if it all happened? It never has uh, been a big movement in America. But what if it did? I say, well, I would consider it my duty not to abandon my post and re resist by all means any challenge of that kind to the American Constitution. I would, I would be ashamed of saying, well, I have another appointment in Hebron. While the, while the United States goes under to fascism. I mean, that, I would think that was disgraceful in the first place. In the second place, if I move to Hebron and a nuclear-armed United States is taken over by an anti-Semitic movement, I'm not going to have moved far enough, <laughs> am I? So if you, my, my doubts about Zionism are, so to speak, existential in that way. And, uh, they, but they also involve the question of principle. Would it, would it be right to say, well, you guys live under fascism, I'm going off to the Holy Land? I can't think of a more uh, wasteful attitude to one's Jewishness. Philip Roth's novel, um, The Plot Against America, um, imagined this, um, the, the rise of a fascist administration in America and the marginalization of the Jews as a prelude to sterner measures. But um, as Clive James ended his review of that book, he said that, uh, as Roth must have felt halfway through the book, that uh, the trouble with the, with the plot against America is that America is against the plot. Uh, the traditions just aren't there. No, though it's quite noticeable that there are two very prominent Americans now um, who both derive from Charles Lindbergh's America First movement, and both f from opposite directions converge as strong opponents of the intervention in Iraq, for example, and American policy in the region generally, Pat Buchanan and Gore Vidal, both explicitly say that Charles Lindbergh is their political role model. Political? Role model and hero. A role model is a word I would never use in any other context, I promise you. But it sometimes has to be used. Pat, Pat Buchanan says he's brought up to worship as, as a hero, and Gore Vidal says he was the hero not just of himself but of the family in which he was brought up, and they were both men, Gore was old enough to actually be a member of America first. Lindberghism is, is one of the great practical jokes on the American anti-war movement. People go and hear these guys thinking they're anti-imperialist speakers, and they don't realize what they're listening to is America first isolationists, whose movement was founded by someone who was very indulgent to anti-Semitism and who took a, a medal from Goering and accused the Jews of being the authors of the Second World War. So I, 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 I find that this, this thread, uh, what I described earlier, is that the protean character of anti-Semitism, the different shape-shifting forms it takes, is always worth paying attention to. And like La Peste, like, uh, to, to make another reference to Camus, the, the, it may go dormant for a very long time. It may go right back into the sewers for a very long time but one day we'll send its rats up to die again in a free city. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> thank you very much. Please, I will ask you to remain seated for a few more minutes. We've got a special announcement to make, and Peter Levy, chairman of the JC and our sponsor, would like to personally 
thank uh, Martin and Christopher no. and make this um, special announcement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, since I'm speaking now, can I, uh, on behalf of everybody and on behalf of the Jewish Chronicle, thank uh, uh, you, Professor Amos, and you, Christopher Hitchens, for a most uh, interesting, enjoyable, and uh, interesting insight into uh, Judaism and uh, Jewish, the Jewish world. I think that we've been privileged this evening for uh, listening to this dialogue and uh, very much appreciate your being here. Thank you very much indeed. The Jewish Chronicle has been involved and uh, sponsored and been associated with Jewish Book Week for a number of years, as you know, and has been the media sponsor for the last 13 years. And we've always uh, enjoyed uh, that. This is one of the consistently most successful Jewish cultural events in the calendar uh, for London and always has a tremendous response and a tremendous audience, and we're delighted to be associated with it. This evening, um, we are announcing in conjunction with Jewish Book Week and the Jewish Book Council uh, the launch of the Chaim Bermant Journalist Prize. Many of you will remember Chaim Bermant as a, an author and a journalist and a columnist of the Jewish Chronicle for, I don't know, 40 years or so, uh, whose witty insights into uh, the community and as a chronicler uh, of the day uh, were not to be missed. And anybody who associated themselves with the Jewish Chronicle uh, read Chaim Bermant, and we're delighted this evening that his widow, Judy Bermant, is with us. This prize uh, we're initiating in conjunction with the Jewish Book Week um, has two parts. Uh, one for uh, any uh, journalist, uh, and secondly for uh, young aspiring journalists. Um, this uh, prize uh, will be uh, looked into by a panel of judges, uh, one of whom will be the uh, editor of the Jewish Chronicle, David Rowan. Jonathan Friedland is another, and there are others who will be participating in this. Um, the first submissions will be required by the end of October this year, and all information and details and terms and conditions uh, can be found either on the Jewish Chronicle website or on the Jewish Book Council website or communicating directly with them. I think it's um, taken us a long time, Judy, to get to this point, but I think that in memory of Chaim Bermant, this is an appropriate thing to do, and we very much look forward to the interesting responses which we hope to get from it and hope that it will be uh, worthwhile and beneficial towards Jew journalism generally and particularly Jewish journalism. I'd like to say that uh, the Jewish Chronicle has always appreciated very much and enjoyed its association with Book Week and we look forward to many further years together and to the success of Jewish Book Week continuing as it, as it clearly seems to be this evening. Thank you very much. Martin and Christopher kindly agreed to uh, sign their books, and they will be signing their books in the um, um, book fair over there. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.